Namaskar Anyong Hasanika. Welcome back to all the participants to this day two of the 10 day workshop on facets of modern India. A truly cosmopolitan masterclass, I must say, by globally renowned experts from India. We have an excellent panel lined up for the next few days, all experts in their own domain to discuss about the facets of modern India. We kick started the workshop yesterday in the presence of Dr. Vinay Shah President of Indian Council of Cultural Relations. Very aptly in his inaugural address, Dr. Shashwat Budde summarized the idea of India in the five points which embodies the essence of India and the Indian identity. The lecture is on our social media handles and you can go back to it for any future reference. For those who are joining us for the first time, I request you to follow, like and subscribe to our social media handles and refer to the inaugural address on the idea of India by Dr. Vinay Shahasrabhute. Without much ado, let us begin with a special address, which will be followed by open house discussion and live interaction by the participants. I'm extremely delighted to have amongst us, Professor Makran Paranjupe, Director of Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Simla, who is joining us live here today from Shimla, along with the presence of Her Excellency, Sri Priya Ranganathan, Ambassador of India to Republic of Korea. With these words, let me call upon Ambassador Supriya Ranganathan for her welcome remarks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Sonu. Uh, uh, I will really not stand between you and uh, the, the speaker whom we are all eagerly waiting for. Uh, I think the, the reputation and the, uh, and the credentials of uh, Dr. Paranjipi are very well known. And uh, just like all of you, I too am uh, really excited about this, uh, about this upcoming session. This is, as, uh, as uh, director of our cultural center has said, is part of our effort to make our friends in, uh, in Korea more in tune with, uh, with India as we, the, the India that we know, which with all its uh, uh, million facets, its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its million contradictions and its uh, million realities. Uh, and I think the philosophical underpinnings of, uh, of the, uh, the nation of India and the civilization of India is fundamental to a real understanding of India. So uh, I'm so, so happy that you accepted our invitation to, uh, to give us this uh, lecture today. And I'm so glad to find that today we have quite a few of our, uh, of our Korean friends. So I hope that we will all come away from this session stimulated and uh, a little bit more knowledgeable about India. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for your remarks. We now move over to the uh, invited speaker, our special guest, Professor Makran Paranjupi, who is currently, as I've just announced, director at Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla. He was educated at St. Stephen's College, Delhi, and the University of Illinois, where he got his master's and PhD in English. He has been professor of English at Jawaharlal Nehru University for over 20 of his 39 years as university teacher. He is the author of some 20 and editor of over two dozen books, in addition to hundreds of academic papers and popular articles. His latest book, his latest books include Swami Vivekananda, Hinduism and India's Road to Modernity, published by Harper and Collins in 2020, New Perspectives in Indian Science and Civilization, again published in 2020 by Routledge, Debating the Post Condition in India, published by Routledge again in 2018, and The Death and Afterlife of Mahatma Gandhi, published by Penguin Random House in 2015. Professor Paranjape is currently a columnist in Open Magazine, The New Indian Express, and The Print. Let us hear to your special lecture, sir, and your views on Indian philosophical traditions with special focus on Swami Vivekananda and the Indian Renaissance. It's a personal pleasure and delight to welcome you once again and look forward to your insights. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Ranganathan, as well as Dr. Sonu Trivedi and Anil Hasio to all my friends in Korea. I'm absolutely delighted to be a part of this workshop for at least two reasons. The first is, of course, that the cultural center in Seoul is named after Swami Vivekananda about whom I'm going to talk a little bit today. And I think in the Q&A, we can uh, deal with 
uh, you know, some of the facets of Indian philosophical traditions, which is the broader rubric of my talk. Uh, and uh, this is especially important because in Korea, Swami Vivekananda is not all that well known, you know, compared to say Rabindranath Tagore or uh, even Mahatma Gandhi. So I think it's time for us to get to know this extraordinary maker of modern India a little better than we know him already. So that's my first reason to be extremely happy and grateful for this opportunity. But my second reason, which is very close to my heart, is that I have visited uh, South Korea maybe eight or nine times. And it's a country that, you know, I hold very dear in my heart. In fact, uh, I've been to, I guess, all parts of uh, South Korea, starting with the demilitarized zone which is not too far from the Gimpo airport, not too far from Seoul, 30th parallel, I think. And I've stood there, you know, with the barbed wire fence and seen the birds going across and also made my own silent prayer that uh, this artificial boundary can be overcome and that we see in our own lifetime the reunification of the Korean people. And right down to Busan, to the coast, beautiful city of Busan, and then to the Jeju Island, you know, which is an extraordinary uh, living museum of Korean history. Uh, and right in the middle, the ancient city of Jeonju, the industrial city of Puhan, where I was invited actually to see the great steel company, POSCO Steel Company, and their university. They have a great university like the Stanford of Korea over there. So I've lectured in different parts of Korea. I've met many Korean intellectuals. And uh, in fact, of, uh, if you ask me, though I shouldn't be saying it in front of our ambassador because I'm not a very diplomatic person. So I have to learn diplomacy from our friends in the Indian Foreign Service. But I've visited, I tell you, the, the triangle countries, which is China, Japan, and Korea. And I might tell you, in all honesty, I feel much closer to the Korean experience. Somehow people are very much more informal, more open. They're not as etiquette bound as the Japanese and they're not as closed, you know, I, I, or as guarded, I would say, as guarded and suspicious and whatever as my Chinese friends can be unless you get to know them. But really this talk is about an extraordinary person, uh, Swami Vivekananda, who shows us how to overcome these cultural barriers and boundaries. And I want to remember, uh, you know, one of his great disciples, Sister Nivedita, an English woman born in Ireland, who gave her whole life uh, to serving her master, Swami Vivekananda, and followed him to India, in fact. She met him in 1895 in London and was so taken by his uh, brilliance, his intellect, uh, but more than that, his wisdom, his compassion, uh, and his, I think, philosophical uh, insights and depth that she, she dedicated her life to India. And in fact, the name that Vivekananda gave her was Nivedita, which in Sanskrit means the dedicated or the consecrated. And the reason I, I invoke uh, Nivedita today is because uh, one of the things she says is that Swamiji, that is Swami Vivekananda. Swami simply means master, and it is a term given to the monks. Now, you know, Korea has a long tradition of monks. I've been to many monasteries. Often they're up in the mountains. There's one near Seoul I went to, and to other parts, in other parts of Korea. And uh, 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 this, this respect given to uh, those who renounce the world is something that Obviously, India and Korea share, as does the entire Eastern world. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, what Nivedita says about Vivekananda is that Vivekananda was not interested in the exchange of ideas. Please understand what I'm trying to say. He was interested in the exchange of ideals, not ideas. Now, why is this important? It's important because in modern times, in our normal academic, or even, uh, you know, cultural interactions and meetings, we exchange ideas. But Vivekananda was interested in exchanging ideals. Now, an ideal means the perfect form of an idea. 
you can remember your Plato, but, the, but uh, what Vivekananda was trying to say is that to understand each other, suppose we have to understand each other uh, as Koreans and Indians, it's not enough just to understand each other's ideas, but we have to understand each other's ideals. That is our society or our culture, our civilization, our traditions at our best. And of course, being modern people, we can also be self-critical and look at uh, whatever is missing. But an exchange of ideals is, I think, uh, a good way to conduct a trans-cultural or trans-civilizational dialogue. And yesterday, you heard Dr. Vinay Sastrabuthi talk about the idea of India. Uh, I've worked on a book by Raja Rao called The Meaning of India. So if another occasion presents itself, we can have a conversation about that. Like, what is the meaning of India? You know, this is the question that Raja Rao, a famous writer, asks. And he answers it in one sentence. He says, India is not a desha. In other words, India is not just a country, a geocultural uh, or geopolitical entity. He says, India is a metaphysic. India is an idea. India is a darshana. The word darshana means a way of looking at the world looking at oneself and looking at the world and thereby transforming both. I think this is the meaning of India. How to understand yourself, how to understand the world, and through this understanding, transform both the self and the world. And I think in some ways, this is the message of Swami Vivekananda, who used the word or the phrase practical Vedanta. You know, Vedanta was supposed to be a sort of uh, life-denying philosophy, though that was a mistaken uh, assumption because our ancient uh, rishis and seers and yogis and gurus were not at all life-denying. But anyhow, uh, in the last couple of hundred years, it had taken on that coloring. So Swamiji made the important point that, Viveka, uh, that, uh, that Vedanta has to be practical in order to be meaningful or useful. And this lecture he gave in London, and uh, probably Sister Nivedita heard that lecture. And then she followed him to India, and, and then gave her life for India, honestly. And uh, uh, Vivekananda died young, before the age of 40. He was born in 1863, and he died in 1902. So he lived to be only, well, 39 years and some months. About eight months or so, seven or eight months. And the Vedita also died young. She died before, you know, she was 45 years old. So it was a different time, but it was a time of great idealism, great dedication, great sacrifice for the reformation and the renewal of India. And that's why I call it the Indian Renaissance, you know, Swami Vivekananda and the Indian Renaissance. I'll talk about that in a moment, but I just wanted to finish my first point about how happy I am to address an audience in, 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 uh, in Korea. And I can only add my own words of welcome to what uh, Dr. Vinay Sahasrabuddhiji said yesterday, that India is a very diverse and complex, multi-layered country and society. You know, a new nation of barely 73, 74 years and a very, very old civilization whose beginnings are shrouded in the mists of time before the historic age as we know it and before records uh, are, uh, you know, really available. So in the deep mythical past of humanity are the roots of Indian civilization. And yet it's a very modern and indeed a young nation with a young population with a certain demographic advantage. So I can only add my words to Dr. Sastrabhutis that uh, please come to India, please visit India, just as, as, as I have visited Korea uh, in all seasons, you know, in, the, in April when the cherry blossoms come out, you know, and I went up to the memorial in Incheon and saw the statue of General MacArthur there, you see, uh, right down to the winter where it's very cold and uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in the summer months too. So I, I invite you, as Dr. Sahasrapudhi did, to please come to India post-corona. And uh, till then, we'll be, uh, I suppose, confined to this virtual interaction. 
And uh, I'm reminded as a student of literature of a poem by Walt Whitman, the great American poet. It's called Passage to India. Now, many of you might have uh, heard about a film called Passage to India. It's actually based on a book by E.M. Forster, which was written in the 20s. I think it was 1924 or 26, called Passage to India. But uh, a, a passage to India. But uh, E.M. Forster got the title of his novel from Walt Whitman, who in his expanding leaves of grass wrote a very important poem called Passage to India, which really links up with Swami Vivekananda's trip to America. I'll explain that in a moment. But the Continental Railroad had opened and uh, from the East Coast of the United States to the West Coast, the, the entire continent was spanned by this railway network. And uh, I think Whitman was very excited because he says, here's a new way to reach India, you know. Uh, Columbus found America looking for India and uh, people would sail from the East Coast to Europe and from Europe sail to India. But now he said that because the world is round from the West Coast, from Los Angeles and San Francisco, you can actually come to India from, from the Pacific side, okay? And he wrote this poem and I just want to quote one stanza of this poem. He says, passage to India, lo soul, seest thou not God's purpose from the first? The earth to be spanned, connected by network, the people to become brothers and sisters, the races, neighbors, to marry and be given in marriage, the oceans to be crossed, the distant brought near. And I think it is this crossing of nations and oceans, the bringing of people together. Uh, I think that is the real purpose of the Indian Council of Cultural Relations and the idea of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, that the world is a family. And this uh, statement comes not only in the Panchatantra and Hitopadesh, but also in the Maha Upanishad. And uh, I think that uh, the peoples of the world can come together in peace only when we begin to appreciate each other uh, at our ideal levels, not just at the daily practical level. So I can assure you that uh, Whitman was absolutely right when he said that a passage to India is always a passage to more than India. So, uh, and in Forster, a passage to India is also the passage to the self, that it's not just a journey outward, but a journey inward, a journey to understand who we are. So with these preliminary remarks, uh, let me come to Swami Vivekananda. Uh, Swami Vivekananda set sail to go to Chicago as a speaker in the parliament, the world's parliament of religions in May, 1893. He set sail from Mumbai uh, or Bombay as it was called at that time. And then the ship went via Colombo. It went to Malaya. And from Malaya, it went, uh, the ship went to Hong Kong. And uh, then uh, it, it went to, to, to Japan. Uh, to Kobe, uh, and and then he took over. He took an overland journey uh, through Osaka, Tokyo, Kyoto to Yokohama, and from Yokohama he took another steamship and reached Vancouver. So he did go the Pacific route, and from there he took an overnight train and reached Chicago. Now, unfortunately, he did not visit Korea. Uh, and uh, in fact, Tagore was much better known in Korea. I don't believe uh, visited Korea either, but he wrote a poem about uh, the Koreans who were suffering from colonialism, Japanese colonialism. And uh, when, when Tagore went to Japan in 1917, he did not support uh, Japanese imperialism. Rather, he wrote a poem to support uh, the Korean people uh, in their struggle against the Japanese, uh, against Japanese imperialism. And of course, you all know the old links, mythical links between Korea and India. A princess from Ayodhya is supposed to have gone to Korea. And then in the Shila period, the great Buddhist uh, incursion 
uh, into Korea and how beautifully it blended with the uh, culture and philosophy, uh, whether it's Taoism or, or in Confucianism already present in the Korean peninsula. So these links are old. And if you go to the Korean embassy in Delhi, as I've been for my visa, there is a plaque to honor the Indian soldiers who fought, uh, you know, for Korea uh, uh, during the war, the Korean War in 1950. Indian soldiers also fought there on the 30th parallel. So these links are very important. But Swami Vivekananda did not go to Korea. That is, this is the point I'm trying to make. Okay. And why is his trip to Chicago so important? It's very important. He, he, he spoke on, the, on what we call 9-11, okay, 9-11, but 1873, not 9-11-2001. And in fact, these are two contrasting ways for cultures to interact. One is you, you have, uh, uh, you know, jet liners filled with fuel smashing into, into uh, skyscrapers and uh, killing many, many, many people. That's one way of cultural interaction, a rather violent way. But Vivekananda's way was different. He addressed the parliament of world religions. He started by saying brothers and sisters of America. And then he gave a wonderful talk on the meaning of India uh, for the modern world. Now, I want to come to my topic, which is called Swami Vivekananda and the Indian Renaissance, uh, and then tie it up to his visit to, to, uh, 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 to Chicago. Uh, what do we mean by the Indian Renaissance? By the Indian Renaissance is meant the rediscovery of India's ancient past in the, you might say, 19th century or late 18th century. Uh, and this happened during the colonial interlude. India was also colonized, in fact, for a much longer period than Korea. And it was during India's colonial period that this so-called renaissance or rediscovery took place. Now, we can ask, how does the Indian Renaissance differ from the European Renaissance? I can speak a little bit about it in a moment. Uh, but what is in common to both is the fact that just as in the European Renaissance, the Europeans discovered their non-religious past, pre-Christian past, their Greco-Roman, you know, uh, what you might call their uh, classical pagan past. You know, the great texts of the Greeks and the Romans, texts in philosophy, astronomy, mathematics, uh, medicine, uh, and so on. And that uh, rediscovery triggered a tremendous energy in Europe, starting in the 14th century, especially in Italy, which was full of city-states at that time. And uh, some say it actually started in Spain, which was at that time ruled uh, by the Moors. It was an Islamic caliphate for a while. And some of these ancient texts had been translated into Arabic and then they were translated into Spanish. So this is how cultural ideas cross nations and cultural boundaries and continents. Anyhow, now this discovery of their ancient past gave Europeans a great confidence and triggered the birth of modern science as well. In India, something similar happened, and Raymond Schwab, a great French Orientalist, actually called it the Oriental Renaissance. So the argument is that the Italian Renaissance, or the European Renaissance, happened in the 14th century and onward, right up to the 16th, 17th. You might say Shakespeare himself was a Renaissance figure. But there was a second Renaissance, which was the Oriental Renaissance, and that was triggered by the discovery of the East, which included the ancient Persia, which, which uh, uh, the Europeans didn't know much about, India, China, Japan, and then eventually Korea. And this happened in the late 18th century. And there were key figures in this uh, discovery, including Sir William Jones, who was the founder, you might call him, of the discipline of philology. And he proved that all these Indo-European languages had a common ancestry, you see, Greek, 
Roman, Sanskrit, Persian were kindred, were like cousins, you know. Uh, and so these were fascinating discoveries. Uh, and uh, of course, the discovery of classical Sanskrit opened up a huge treasure trove of knowledge, uh, not only for the West, but also for India, because by that time, a lot of Indian texts had been lost through invasion, fires. One of our great libraries at Nalanda. Nalanda was this uh, old Indian university founded, you know, a, you might say almost a couple of thousand years ago, around the first or second century of the current era. And it was destroyed around uh, 1193, 94, around that time. Uh, uh, so it, it flourished for a long time, almost a thousand years it flourished. And then it was burnt. Uh, and so there was a lot of scattering and destruction of the ancient knowledge in India. And somehow, during British colonialism, there was a special partnership for a while, uh, which enabled the translation and rediscovery of these ancient texts. And in that sense, it also fueled Indian nationalism, India's drive to become a modern country. Now, to give you parallels, it, it's a bit like the Meiji Restoration, though not quite the same. Uh, you know, under the Emperor Meiji in 1868, if I'm not mistaken, Japan passed from the shogunate, you know, it was uh, the, the Tokugawas, the, the shoguns, the feudal lords who were uh, running Japan, and then the emperor assumed authority again. There was a reform, renewal, uh, a, a huge boost to industrial productivity, rapid industrialization, and the adoption of Western ideas. And of course, uh, the Emperor Meiji ruled like Queen Victoria for a long, long time. I think at least, I would say, maybe 40, 45 years. Now, something similar was also going on in uh, Korea. It was called, I think, the Kabo reforms were happening. And uh, this uh, the point I'm trying to make is this modernization process about which I've written in my book. Uh, I'll show you a copy of my book. Uh, it's available on Kindle as well if you want to read it. Where I've talked about Vivekananda's role in the modernization of India. Uh, I think I've spoken for about 20 minutes or 23 minutes. So I'll wind up in about five or seven minutes. Then we can have a Q&A. Now, what happened uh, during the Indian Renaissance? was that there were figures like Ram Mohan Roy, who tried to reform India uh, and Indian traditions, Indian philosophy, revive it. Uh, then there was the Arya Samaj movement, which was back to the Vedas, which is going back to the ancient texts of the Hindus. And uh, there was also a discovery, a rediscovery of Buddhism, which had left Indian shores because uh, after the invasions, the Islamic invasions, most of the monasteries, most of the viharas had been destroyed and uh, many of the Buddhists had been converted. So Buddhism uh, was born in India but had left Indian shores and there were very few Buddhists left, left in mainland India when the British came. We had Buddhists in the hills like where I am in Himachal Pradesh. There are ancient Buddhist communities. In fact, the Dalai Lama lives in my state now, Himachal Pradesh. But he, of course, came as an exile from China. So Buddhism had left Indian shores many years ago, thousands of years ago, a thousand years ago. It reached Korea and Japan about 1500 years ago. And uh, around the 19th century, 18th, 19th century, in main land India, there were very few Buddhists left. But in Darjeeling, in the hills, in Ladakh, in Nepal, our border with, uh, you know, Tibet, there were still indigenous and old Buddhist communities. But this was also a period for the rediscovery of Buddhism in India. And indeed, at the world's parliament of religions, there were representatives, uh, Buddhist representatives from Sri Lanka and from, I believe, from Japan. So this rediscovery of India's past offered an impetus to modernization 
in India and also nationalism. And in both these processes, Vivekananda played a very, very important role. So uh, after his spectacular debut in Chicago, he became a speaker in great demand. And for four and a half years, he didn't come to India. He lived in America. He traveled twice to the, to the United Kingdom, Great Britain in those days, which was ruling India. And he had a lot of followers because he talked about a very open and rational way of understanding yourself, reaching God uh, or reaching divine. You can be an atheist, atheist and you can still be a Vedantin. Okay? And he gave the three great paths, you know, which were ancient paths already available in the Bhagavad Gita, but he, he put them together. You know, he synthesized them in his lectures in New York and London. So what are these three paths? One is the path of devotion and love. It's called Bhakti Yoga, Bhakti Marga. Yoga means joining. It's the same root as the English word yoke. So yoga means to bring together, to join. What do you want to join? You want to join yourself, your small ego-bound self, to the divine self, to the cosmic self, to the universal self. And one way is through the path of love or devotion. That is called Bhakti Yoga. The other way is the path of knowledge through reasoning, through logic, through understanding, through the use of the mind to transcend the mind. So Swami Vivekananda gave many lectures and wrote a book called Jnana Yoga. And Jnana Yoga means, Jnana means knowledge and that's the same root as the word uh, you know knowledge in english or gnosis g n o s i s so you have the english word gnostic you know so what is gnosticism it was an ancient christian uh, sect who wanted to realize god in their heart and the catholic church at that time there was only one big church except the eastern catholic church and they outlawed the gnostics and the Gnostics were unfortunately, you know, their doctrines were outlawed and, and considered illegitimate. Anyhow, but Gnosticism is the union of the soul with the divine through knowledge of the self. So that's the path of knowledge. And then is the path of action or the path of work. And that is called Karma Yoga. The word Karma is very common even in Buddhism. It means your actions. And often karma is used as, you know, your past actions determining or influencing the present. But that is not what Vivekananda meant. Vivekananda meant by karma the present actions which can influence your future. So for him, karma was a doctrine of choice and freedom, not of predestination or predetermination. Now, what is the path of works? The path of works suits those who have a very active temperament. So if you go back to the Sankhya theories of the Gunas, we have three temperaments. Some are very, very active. You know, as soon as they get up in the morning, they whip out their phone or their computer and they start working. All day they work. They want to build bridges. They want to start foundations. They want to earn money. They want to open schools and colleges, etc., etc. They have a very active temperament. For them, the way of works. Now, what does it mean? Usually we work for our own benefit, you see. We work for our own selfish interests or at the most the interests of our family. But Vivekananda showed us that through the path of works, you can transcend your selfishness by doing not just charitable works, but every action that you perform, you can surrender the results of that action. You know, so you have the right to effort, but the outcomes are not in our hands. And friends, I'm older than most of you. I can tell you my experience of life is that outcomes are completely out of our hands. We may want a particular outcome and something completely different happens. And especially at the most important moments of our lives, uh, it, it is often shown to us that, you know, uh, if we don't, I mean, if we think we have choice, then, uh, and uh, 
you know, if we think we are in control, we are deeply mistaken, you know. We do want to be in control, I agree. But, you know, often we find that life is so complicated and actually the chain of causality is so complex that you cannot unlink this infinite chain of causality. So what you do is you surrender uh, your actions, you surrender your intentions, you purify your intentions and you surrender your outcomes. So that's the path of works. So the path of devotion, the path of knowledge, the path of works. And then the fourth, which he talks about, is called Raja Yoga or the royal path. And that in fact is linked to what you understand by yoga today in Korea. There are so many yoga studios in Korea and Hatha Yoga or the physical postures is only one aspect of Raja Yoga. Raja Yoga is actually Ashtanga Yoga of Patanjali and it has eight steps like the Buddha's eightfold path. And you know, and it is Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, Pratyahar, Dharan, Dhyan, Samadhi, like that. Eight limbs of yoga. And why is this the royal path? Because if you follow this path, you will end up with a higher consciousness. This is what Patanjali's Yoga Sutras tell you. And, you know, I started reading these Yoga Sutras when I was in my 20s. In fact, when I was in America, I took a yoga course. So this is how culture travels, okay? And I still remember my guru, my American guru, Guru Lois Steinberg. Uh, and she was trained by B.K. Sayangar. And uh, I started reading the Yoga Sutras. The point I'm trying to make is that even the first of the Eightfold Path, the Yamas, my goodness, they're so difficult. It's like the Panchashil, you know, truth, that is Satya, Ahimsa, truth, non-violence, Satya, Ahimsa, Brahmacharya, chastity, Aparigraha, non-hoarding, non-stealing, you know. You finish with these five, uh, that's it. You don't need any more morality. And, uh, you know, I'm still stuck on the first one, truth. You know, the dimensions of truth are so infinite and inviting to me that I'm not getting beyond that. I'm only trying to experiment as Gandhiji did with this one yama. And uh, of course, I do my own asanas and all of that. But so Swami Vivekananda picked up these ancient ideas from the Bhagavad Gita, from in fact, the tantras also, from the griha sutras, you know, from the Upanishads, from the Vedas, and from Narad Bhakti sutras. And so he became a great synthesizer of Hinduism in modern times. And to end, what I wanted to say is that not only did he revive Indian philosophy, but he was a great social reformer. He was a great nationalist. And though we were colonized, he, uh, he, he laid, you might say, or he sowed the seeds of the new India. And what is the new India? If I might sum it up, the new India is an exciting journey from Narendra Nath Datta. Narendra Nath was his name, then he became Swami Vivekananda. Narendra Nath Datta to Narendra Modi, who is our current Prime Minister. In fact, you'll be uh, surprised to know, but our Prime Minister was named after Vivekananda. Narendra Modi was named after Narendra Nath. Datta, that is Swami Vivekananda. So what is this trajectory of modern India? The trajectory of modern India is to embrace rationality, to embrace pluralism, to embrace democracy, to embrace science and technology, to embrace material prosperity, to embrace development of all aspects of human life. But yet, to do this without losing your cultural identity, without losing your sense of self, without losing your link with your ancient past, without losing your, you might say, you know, resources of wisdom, which are thousands of years old. So this unique synthesis of the past and the present to go towards a new future was the vision of Vivekananda. And why is this different from that of some other people? You think about China and their cultural revolution. They destroyed everything of their past. So if you go to China today, the monasteries are mostly rebuilt. 
even the Great Wall of China has been rebuilt because many revolutions, you know, they say the revolutions eat up their children, you know. So you destroy or, you know, I, I think I put it the other way. I think the quote, the quote from the French Revolution is as follows. Revolutions, uh, I think, kill parents and nationalisms eat up their children, something like that. But I can give you the quote. I have it somewhere. It's a French man called Le Pen. Anyhow, the long and short is many revolutions result in a complete destruction of the past, a complete denial of the past. And the ancient world, the classical world, was ravaged and destroyed. But it was a world which had a number of good things. And it was Swamiji who taught us how to reconcile that past without rejecting the modernity of the present. That's why I brought in the 9-11 of 2001. It was a counter-systemic movement where you rejected the modern world. You called it the great Satan, you know? So I think India's is the third way. You don't go back to the past because that's impossible. The golden past is only a fantasy. Nor, nor can you reject the modern world, you know? So you neither reject the past, nor do you reject the present, but you find the middle path of reconciling the two to create a new nation. Thank you so much. I'll stop there. Uh, probably that was the alarm <laughs> to stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paranjipe, for this brilliant lecture, brilliant uh, exposition. And uh, uh, in a very simplified manner, you have uh, put forward uh, this entire complex uh, idea about um, um, about Indian philosophy, different strands of Indian philosophical traditions, and about Swami Vivekananda. And uh, very aptly, in fact, uh, you uh, in in your uh, some of your last lines, you talked about how uh, Vivekananda was the synthesizer of modern India and how he uh, sowed the seeds of new India. In fact, so uh, but this is one less uh, one takeaway probably our participants could take uh, uh, could take from your lecture is is that how how being modern we have to be rooted to our culture to our history and. Uh, in this process of modernization, we should not uh, um, uh, give away um, with our uh, rich his, uh, history, uh, with our rich uh, civilizational legacy that we have. And and um, and uh, very well, you 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 uh, you have uh, mentioned how um, our present Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi has been named after. Uh, Swami Vivekananda Narendra, from Narendra Nath Datta to Narendra Modi. In fact, uh, this is a good uh, information for our Korean friends also. Uh, and, and, and we hope uh, from your lecture and, and the way you have uh, uh, very aptly um, um, summarized the views of uh, Swami Vivekananda, his concept of modernity, practical Vedanta, uh, 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 will uh, benefit our our. our all the participants from India as well as Korea. I, I see a number of hands raised. I also request our uh, friends uh, from Korea to keep your questions ready. We have um, uh, the facility of um, simultaneous interpretation. Our interpreters will help in interpreting your views or you can even write your questions in the chat box. Meanwhile, um, uh, before I request our participants to ask the question, I see many hands raised. Uh, let me quickly uh, um, uh, take the advantage of being the moderator and just raise one uh, particular question. Though this is not a question, a uh, concern and uh, maybe if you can respond to it because all our participants are uh, like a youth from all around the world. We have some participants from Russia and from UK. So some other countries also uh, we have uh, participants probably just one question that uh, keeps bothering us as an academician in fact and also um, as a uh, like uh, since um, I'm, uh, personally since I'm heading the cultural sector these kinds of questions also keeps coming to me so I, I just wanted uh, you to respond uh, as you have referred that uh, Swami Vivekananda talked about a trans civilizational dialogue we, we, we talk about having a dialogue between different civilizations, different religions. But given the intolerance that we have in the world and, and um, in the world, in India, uh, 
and, and several countries we see that this is a major issue and the way it has been captured by media so professor paranjipe i would like you to respond to this so that uh, some message our youth can uh, um, take away from this absolutely thank you sonuji first i want to show you uh, this book uh, which you can also get on kindle uh, the ideas that i shared with you are all in this book and uh, Uh, it does deal with uh, the challenges of modernity for ancient civilizations like india and korea now the question you have raised sonuji is is a very important question because question because as i said uh, you can respond with a 911 kind of uh, reaction to a civilization that whose values say you don't share then you just want to bring it down or you can respond through dialogue now one of the most important contributions of vivekananda is that he was a pioneer in two kinds of dialogue so one was an inter religious dialogue and uh, the world's parliament of religions was for the first time uh, uh, showcasing the possibility of people of different faiths coming together on the same platform though to be perfectly honest the organizers who were mostly uh, you know uh, american protestant christians still came from the assumption that christianity was if not the only way the superior way so when you deal with uh, with cross cultural dialogue uh, sonuji you can start with the position of uh, what you might call exclusivism that my way is the only way you know that if you want to reach heaven or if you want to reach god or whatever you want to be saved then only my way will take you there so vivekananda said that look broaden your horizons he said uh, don't be fanatical you know so he was actually challenging the exclusivists and the exclusivism was within christianity too because the pope didn't send anybody uh, to the world's parliament of religions the archbishop of canterbury did not send anybody so among christians the denominations were not talking to each other you see so uh, and the caliph uh, who was in turkey at that time he didn't send anybody he said because islam is the only way so then so from exclusivism then there's another one called inclusivism inclusivism means that okay i'll listen to you but you know what my way is still the best so i will include you in my way and some people say that uh, vivekananda himself was a vedantic inclusivist in in other words he believed vedanta was the best but i disagree with that because i think he said it only when people said that theirs was the best when people said ours is the best he said no mine is the best you know so he was also being strategic so there's exclusivism there's inclusivism and then there's pluralism the pluralism means that i am also incomplete mine i don't have perfection okay and you are also incomplete and we start with the proposition that none of us is complete in ourselves whether it's as individuals or as cultures or civilizations or nations and the dialogue is is premised on the assumption that we can complete each other you know and i think that is the kind of pluralism that will encourage the dialogue of civilizations that you spoke of sonuji and here i want to and my response by saying uh, vivekananda initiated another kind of dialogue not just the dialogue of religions but the dialogue of science and religion now why is this important because right in the 19th century vivekananda understood that science is going to be more important than religion in the modern world that our view of the world whether the earth is round how many stars there are whether there's a heaven whether there's a hell whether there's soul or is the brain everything whether there's life after death whether there's reincarnation all these kinds of questions more and more people will rely on science and not religion so he said science and religion must talk to each other why because religions will become more scientific they will become more rational they will be more verifiable they won't be based on dogma so what vivekananda did was to bring about a religious revolution where you got away from dogma and belief and the basis of religion became your own spiritual experience 
and your own conduct in the world. You know, to put it in Sanskrit, it became Anubhav, Vichar and Achar. Anubhav is your understanding, your deep experience of reality, the ultimate reality. So it's not secondhand. It's not something you've read in a book. You don't believe something because some book says it or some guru says it or your father or mother said it, which is all good, but because you've deeply experienced it. For example, we all say compassion is good, but if you don't experience compassion, it's just a word, it's just a mental construct, right? Or if you, if you, if you uh, say love, all of us have read, you know, romance novels, right? But if you haven't really experienced love, uh, even at the human level, by the way, you're just, you're, just, you're just looking at love as a soap opera or love as a Harlequin romance. Only when you deeply fall in love, even at the very human level, can you experience love. And of course, in the Bhakti Mark, the human and divine get toggled, as in the story of Mirabai, who treats Krishna like a human love. Okay? So in India, we are one of the few civilizations we don't distinguish between uh, very rigidly between spiritual love and corporeal love, between the profane and the sacred, they merge. So my point is, without experience, everything is just empty rhetoric. So Anubhav, then Vichar. If you have no uh, you know, rat ratiocination, you don't think, you don't reflect, you know, I think it was Socrates who said, an unreflected life is not worth living. So you experience something, then you, you, you organize that experience. You may want to revisit it. You may want to even alter it. For example, you enter a room and you may take an instinctive dislike for somebody. And then you say, you know what, that's not fair. So through reasoning, through analysis, through your analytical ability, you temper your experience. So Anubhav, then Vichar, and then Achar. Achar is finally... It's not pickle, you know, achar is another word for pickle, but here it means, you know, what you do in your life. Your conduct is the test of your ideas. I mean, you talk a lot of truth, but if you're a hypocrite, then it's all pointless, right? You're leading a fake life. And today everyone wants to lead an authentic life because once your material needs are fulfilled, then you're searching for something deeper. So I think it's Vivekananda who, who showed us that religion should not be merely dogma. It should be rational. It should be based on experience. So these two dialogues that he started or initiated or pioneered and made a very big contribution is, is the dialogue between religions and the dialogue between science and religion or science and spirituality. To me, uh, Sonuji, these two can be models for intercultural dialogue as well. Thank you, Professor Paranjipi, for that uh, explanation. I'm, I'm sure our participants would certainly gain from it. Um, now, um, I think there are several uh, raised hands. We can request them uh, to uh, raise their questions. Meanwhile, I request also our Korean friends to also please uh, write your questions in the chat box or you can raise your hand. Our interpreter will help in interpreting. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there is a partic participant, uh, Larissa, from Russia. Ms. Larissa, yeah, yeah, you... Dr. Trivedi, I have to leave in another about 10 minutes if you don't okay, mind. So quickly, I have to work. quickly, we can take some questions. Uh, quickly, I think uh, just one round of questions if we can take. We can just collect and then uh, you can respond. Ms. Larissa? Thank you very much. It is a very interesting lecture. Actually, uh, I am a scholar on Japan and then I studied China. I stayed in China for a few years. And today you raised a lot of issues that are very uh, interesting for someone who spent time in China and who is from Russia. Uh, such as you said that Swami Vivekananda was not interested in the exchange of ideas, but he was interested in the exchange of ideals. I think this is very profound. And actually, what do you think uh, is the explanation? Maybe this is the explanation besides the part on exclusion. Yes, because uh, 
China is 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 ex ex exclusionism. You you exactly said that that uh, the renaissance in China that they're trying to do to do now before they were trying to do cultural revolution and it ended up in destruction of everything. They are trying to do the renaissance now, but it also ends up in very extreme and very exclusive kind of nationalism. So maybe maybe how 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 would you explain what what is the difference between India and China in, in this uh, in the ideas part maybe because the Chinese they always say reality reality we need to be realistic they, they always use reality and they say idealist should be the perfect form of something so maybe this helps or how would you explain that and that uh, in in India actually it worked uh, towards opening and in China it always uh, works like uh, towards destruction uh, maybe we will request. Uh... Our ambassador, uh, ma'am, uh, if you have uh, if you have any question or if you would like to respond, maybe uh, quickly we can uh, take your response. So I'll just uh, very quickly uh, come in. I thought that was a fascinating uh, uh, session, uh, Dr. Paranjipe, and thank you so much for that. I just thought that our Korean friends would also. Uh, be interested in hearing if you have the, if you can spare a little bit of time just to uh, in a way expand on the on the idea and the notion of how the uh, the the ethos of indian philosophy has always been a very inclusive and a very you know receptive philosophy in which it's not necessarily the people of one uh, uh, who have adopted one path whether it is the bhakti path or the jnana path or uh, or any other uh, any other path or indeed if it is uh, it is uh, 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 a non hindu path all of these are influences that have always been very much part of the indian ethos so i just thought that if you could uh, expound a little bit on that that would probably be a, of a lot of interest to our uh, to our korean listeners but it was fascinating thank you so much thank you ma'am thank, thank you professor paranjipe just one last question um uh, we, from one of our korean friends uh, miss bomin you have a question Yes, I have a question, uh, thank you for your inspiring uh, lecture, it was really uh, helpful to understand. But uh, just uh, one question, you talked about practical Vedanta, uh, could you please explain a little bit more about it? Yes, 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 thank you. I think, I think I'll try to address all three questions and uh, maybe at some other point we can have a just a Q&A, a kind of really freewheeling follow-up, uh, if time permits, because today, unfortunately, I have to go. Go meaning I have a pile of files and there's a deadline, so one o'clock, because uh, anyhow, and we uh, have uh, uh, another event in the afternoon when the district commissioner is going to come and lecture to us on how uh, he has uh, uh, worked to prevent COVID-19 from spreading in this hill station of Shimla. We have, a, luckily for us, a very low uh, case load here in Shimla. Just a couple of hundred people have been infected and only, I'm told, three people have died in this town of Shimla, uh, which is uh, about half a million people almost. Anyhow, so I think all the three questions are really important. And, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to what Larissa said from Russia, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, m many times in their own reformative process, civilizations hurt themselves so much. And that self-inflicted suffering and trauma is sometimes more than that, that, that is inflicted by others, by invaders and so forth. And unfortunately, that seems to be the case in China. Uh, you know, there is a, a tetralogy by Frank de Cotter, where he has outlined four books and four books, uh, The Great Leap Forward, The Cultural Revolution, you know, the famines and all of that. And about 40, 50 million people uh, probably died. The evidence is massive. Now, what happens is that uh, uh, there are elements of communism uh, which can sit or which can, uh, you know, interface with Confucianism, because both are very practical, both are this-worldly, 
And uh, let's not forget, there's a lot of idealism and pragmatism and in practical uh, you know, philosophy. It's also, also idealistic. See, Japan, uh, sorry, China, with its idea of the Middle Kingdom, wanted to create a perfect social order on earth. You know, so they wanted to realize the ideal. And uh, in some ways, communism also wanted to create a perfect society, uh, classless, no, prop no private property, and the state would wither away. Instead, the state is so powerful, so authoritarian, we need not go into that. So I think if uh, we, we can only be contra-factual uh, here, you know, if it had not gone the communist way, then like Korea, like Japan, you know, if the Kuomintang, if uh, Chiang Kai-shek, if those people, what they did in Taiwan had happened, then modern China would have been a little bit like, uh, you know, what we have in Taiwan. Uh, I mean, the People's Republic would have been like Taiwan or Singapore, where, yeah, it is ordered, it is more authoritarian, but it's not... It's not what happened in China, the horrors of, uh, of the dictatorship, the communist dictatorship and how, how many people died and so forth. There might have been a different kind of blend is what I'm trying to say, which luckily for India, you know, we didn't have to go that much in our self-inflicted torture, though partition was a terrible moment. You know, now there's a partition industry which keeps escalating figures, but uh, on reliable, British authorities, about 200 people were, were killed in the partition, which is still modest compared to 50 million, or even in the gulags and other things in, in the Soviet era under Stalin. So these self-inflicted wounds can be terrible. And it's only through moderation, through the middle path, which is what I want to come, come back to uh, in, the, uh, in the second and third question. Now, the second question was about uh, actually, it was ambassador's question, and I think that question was about pluralism, deep pluralism. Now, what is the foundation of it? It is, as Dr. Sahasrabhudde said, ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti. It's from the Rigveda. So, truth is one, the wise call it by many names. So, this is a unique proposition because it doesn't lead to the relativism of postmodernism because the unity of truth is taken as an assumption. And yet it allows tremendous pluralism, right? So I think this is an old formula which Swami Vivekananda's guru, Sri Ramakrishna, rephrased in rustic Bengali, Joto Mot Toto Pot. He says, whatever your mindset, whatever your opinion, you will find a path commensurate with that. So if you like devotion, you'll find that path. If you like action, that's okay too. If you like an Islamic way of worship, fine. If you like a Christian way, you're welcome to go that way. And in, in individual families, you have Hindu families in which Christ is the favorite deity, you know, for son and daughter. And it's perfectly all right because the mother may have Kali, the father may have Shiva. So there is a deep pluralism which India permits. So if your opinions are not accepted, it doesn't mean you're going to be stoned or hung or crucified. You know, all that it may mean is you, you go another 50 kilometers away and start your own ashram. You can have your own following. And in fact, the makers of Indian constitution also believed in this, what I call positive secularism. In my book, I actually have a chapter called Dharmic Secularism, where this idea that we should respect all faiths is the Indian kind of secularism. Indian secularism doesn't mean you get away from all religion. No, it means that all dharmas, all paths should be respected, okay? As long as they're not illegal, you know, and uh, or they're not harmful, or they're not, uh, you know, uh, should I say against human rights? Because, you know, there are things, there are some practices which we have outlawed in India, which are absolutely unacceptable in modern times, you know? So this, is a, this was the Indian pluralism, which still exists. So whether we are minoritarian in our political arrangements or majoritarian, our pluralism is still very strong. And, uh, you know, we agree to disagree. We are a lively and argumentative lot. Amartya Sen has a book called The Argumentative Indian. Uh, and uh, 
you know, there's always a joke about Indians that uh, if you have, like there was a company meeting and uh, you had to conduct negotiations. So the Japanese group, they left the room and they had their own discussion and they came back with one consensus opinion. And the Indian group, they started quarreling amongst themselves and uh, so the people they were negotiating with, they got confused and they left the room, you know. And uh, so Indians can be like that. They are very individualistic. Our entire way of life is totally decentralized. And I think that can be a strength. Our diversity is not a weakness. I believe it is a strength. And Indian pluralism can accommodate and digest practically, you know, any kind of uh, view except those views which are, I would say, anti-Sanatani. I've, I've made a framework of this. Next time we talk, I can share that framework with you. Non-Sanatani is fine. Anti-Sanatani means it's like you take over a system and then you destroy the very foundation of that system. So it's like what the Nazis did. You get elected, but then you abolish elections. And we see those forms of intolerance, as Sonuji said. So I would invoke Karl Popper there and I would say we must be intolerant to certain kinds of intolerance. Because if we are not intolerant to intolerance, then our whole fabric of tolerance will be destroyed. So modern and plural and free societies have to uh, legislate at times uh, on limits of tolerance for sheer self-survival. Now the last question on practical Vedanta. So what happened is that uh, because of a very great philosopher called Shankaracharya, there was a notion uh, which was that the world is an illusion. I mean, that's not what Shankaracharya said. But what Shankaracharya said is that there is no reality other than the one divine consciousness. And what we call reality, you know, the table, the chair, the glass, you know, the cup. He said this is adhyasa. It's like a superimposition. It's almost like quantum, you know, because, you know, the table looks very real, but at the subatomic level, it's not real. And there's so much space in between. It's more like what the Buddhists call impermanence. There's nothing that seems to be permanent, including your own body. So uh, that kind of philosophy of illusionism uh, came to be characterized as the Hindu way of life, which is that it doesn't matter what happens. You may have, uh, you know, really terrible living conditions. Uh, you know, you may have disease, uh, infant mortality. Uh, you know, your sewage system doesn't work. You know, you have no transportation. Your people are starving. But how does it matter? Because the world is an illusion, you know. So what Vivekananda did, he said, look, this kind of philosophy is completely contrary to our ancient Indian ethos because our rishis were supremely practical people. They were not even monks. They raised families. They had ashrams. They trained people, students. They were philosophers. They did agriculture. They raised cattle. So Vivekananda said, Hinduism is not otherworldly. It is actually to understand this world in order to transform it. It is not worldly in the way in which materialism is worldly, nor is it otherworldly in the sense that this reality that we experience, you know, as sentient beings is an illusion. No. But that practical Vedanta is to succeed in our own world. In fact, when I talk to young people about Vivekananda, I said, look, you guys, you know, you may think this is some old fuddy-duddy, but... Uh, do you, want to, do you want to go to IIT? Do you want to get into medical school? Do you want to earn a million dollars? The secret is here. Because it's practical Vedanta. It teaches you how to succeed in the world. Because if you can't succeed in this world, I can assure you there's no success in some other world. But success is meant living on your own terms, using the powers of concentration, you know, to do good for yourself and others. And I think practical Vedanta is based on the simple premise that there are no others. Okay, there is only myself and yourself and we are not others. There are only 
we are all different versions of the same self you know and that is so therefore the moment i see you as another version of myself it's very difficult for me to hate you even if you are really let's say you know making my life miserable even then i'll say you know what okay i may stay away from you you have to stay away from toxic people but there's a certain understanding that personality or uh, uh, you know the difference of culture the difference of food habits the difference in beliefs are not as deep as they seem you know and that humanity is not all that different and practical vedanta is premised on the idea that we can help each other only if we accept one another as different versions of the same uh, infinite self i think that is the essence of practical vedanta and i think on that note uh, if you excuse me it's really been a nice morning for me here and a good afternoon for you there i hope so let me formally thank you all once again thank you thank you for your participation and uh, i look forward to your participation again tomorrow thank you thank you kamsa hum tomorrow thank you, thank you. Thank you.